It was the day before my 18th birthday, on a Friday night that would remind anyone of the cold night of an evening autumn. My mother was helping my invigorated brother read his preschool homework as usual, while my little sister was vehemently watching cartoons in the living room. As I opened the slightly aged door to my room, I was greeted by a slightly vexatious voice. I've got your report card back, dear. I'm proud of you. Your father would have been so proud. Treat my mother as she suddenly noticed my presence. Oh, yeah, thanks, Mom. I blurted out as I quickly closed my bedroom door behind me. Since my father died, my mother has never fully recovered. However, instead of coming to terms with her grief, she had begun to pressure me into a degree of advanced mathematics, a subject that I could have cared less about. I still didn't even remember it. My family just assumed that I was traumatized by the event, and with no reason to doubt them, I believed them. However, deep down, I knew that simply wasn't the truth. It's not that it's a blurry, incoherent mess. It's like it didn't happen at all. One moment he was there, the next he was gone. I never even properly grieved over his loss. Regardless, I never really gave it much thought. I was too busy getting a degree I didn't even want. I couldn't even stop and consider why I didn't remember such an important, life-changing event. I shrugged off this feeling as I thoughtlessly walked into my room to complete my homework. As I sat down and mindlessly did my homework, my mind began to drift. I could sit for hours and think of nothing. But before anything of value could come out of my little brainstorming session, I felt a tap on my shoulder, followed by a gentle, Honey, you've been doing your homework now for three hours. Why don't you take a break and go get some dinner? Murmured my mother with an almost desperate tone in her voice. Um, okay, Mom. I acknowledged as I drearily got up from my desk. I casually stretched out slightly backwards and imprudently scratched my lower back in the most stereotypical display of fatigue possible. As I walked lazily towards the bathroom, my mother in an almost melancholy tone of voice said, Wait, don't you want to eat dinner? And to which I almost instantly replied with, Don't worry, I'll eat extra tomorrow morning. With this, my mother seeming satisfied, walked out of the room with a certain nervous attitude that left me unfazed. I sluggishly walked into my bathroom. However, as I stepped in, I felt a certain, primeal sense of fear as I walked into the dimly lit room. As I now cautiously walked into the room, I noticed that my toothbrush wasn't in its usual place. With a slightly confused expression of surprise, I opened my mirrored bathroom cabinet to look for my toothbrush. To my further disgust, my toothbrush was nowhere to be seen. In fact, nothing in my bathroom drawer was anywhere to be seen. With a sense of defeat, I closed the bathroom cabinet with an abrupt thud. As it swung closed, in the corner of my eye, I saw something truly bone chilling. There, inside the bathroom cabinet reflection, I was nowhere to be seen. I jumped backwards in pure, fear-driven bewilderment. I almost lost my balance as my footing escaped me. After carefully balancing myself, I momentarily ogled at the bizarre curiosity. And then suddenly, I felt a stiff, inhuman-like tap on my left shoulder. It felt cold, but not in the slightest damp, like a doorknob after a snowstorm. Too afraid to move and too afraid to call for help to my now proudly sound asleep family, I stood completely silent and motionless. As I stood still for what felt like hours, I started to feel at ease when the tap was not followed up by my immediate death. However, right before I was about to make a run for it, I felt the same alien tap on my shoulder once again. Fearing the worst, I quickly turned around and began to mumble at whatever was tapping me as best as I could. 
Uh, who are you? At that moment, an arm appeared from behind me and wrapped around my shivering, sweat-covered back, turning me to face whatever it was that was now behind me. As it gestured me to turn, I made eye contact with whatever that thing was. And to my surprise, it wasn't some monster. No serial killer, no monster with a tooth or scale. No ghost, phantom, ghoul, or goblin. It was me. It was almost exactly like me. It, however, wasn't an exact copy of me. Instead of eyes, this thing had a pitch black void where its eyes would have been, had they been present. It had a foul, rotten odor that could only be described as rotten eggs. It had this weird aura around it that felt like the pull of two magnets tugging at each other between a solid substance. It had a strange, ghoulish posturing, like one would imagine an uneasy criminal would have after getting away with a serious crime. However, it had a certain attractive ambience that paled in comparison to its other imperfections. Well, hello there, Evan. Or should I say me? How are we doing today? It chuckled with an unnervingly large smile as it looked directly into the fiber of my being. Its tone was deceitful, in a manner that would not be out of place on a used car lot. What the? Who are you? What are you doing here? Please, don't hurt me. I said as I slightly walked backwards and slowly raised my hands up in a defensive gesture, before tripping backwards and falling onto the ground with a climactic thud. Hurt you? Uh, I mean me. Why would I hurt me? It slithered as I stared into its grinning, soulless face. Still awestruck, I managed to blurt out. What? What do you want with me? It, not missing a beat, jumped to life, towering before my cowering pleads as it began to talk, with a now much less informal tone. <laughs> my name is Nomad. I am you, but you know not. I come to offer us a bargain, so to speak. So, if we are willing to hear what you have to say, simply stay where you are and I will tell you what you want to hear. If not, you can walk right out of that bathroom door and never hear or see from me again. Now back onto my feet, I changed my gaze to look at the door before looking back at Nomad. Although paralyzed with fear, my curiosity was my downfall. Slowly, after a slightly awkward period, I silently whimpered. What do you have to offer me? Its posture slightly changed as it flinched forward in glee. With this, it jumped for joy, almost as a child does on Christmas Eve, before he began to speak. I know why you didn't walk out of that door. I know what you were feeling. I was there once, just like you. You are just mindlessly listening to me right now, watching, waiting. You feel restless, uneasy even. You are listening to you right now because you are seeking something more. At least, that's what you are now thinking to yourself. But like all things that make us happy, it's a lie. A dirty, rather obvious lie. I know why you are really here, even if you don't. At least not yet. Deep down, even if you don't know it consciously, you are insecure. You feel it at all times, even if you don't want to, or don't recognize it yet. You know the truth. Every time you get up and ready yourself for the day, you feel it. Every time you experience the trials of the day, you feel it. Every time you drift off to sleep at the end of every day, you feel it. All day, every day, you feel it creep up on you. Apprehension, avoidance, fear, pain, anxiety, it never ends. You fear that you said something wrong. You fear that you are going down the wrong track. You fear that you're not being the person you know you can be. You fear why you don't remember what happened to your father. You worry about the disapproval of others. 
So, you seal yourself into a box created by your own volition. You are so afraid of rejection, of not fitting in, that you don't put yourself into situations that otherwise would improve your emotional state. You're anxious when entering a conversation, afraid you'll have nothing to talk about, afraid that you will offend, afraid that you are not good enough. You always hide yourself, putting up a defensive wall to protect your ego. You claim that it's my personality or I like being alone but I know the truth. You hate your self-imposed prison. You hate undergoing the daily, chronic trouble of living within your own mind. So, why do you lock yourself within? Because you secretly want one thing, and one thing only. Power. How do I know this? You are still here listening now. Day after day, night after night. You do the same humdrum shtick. You wake up, you work, and then you go back to bed. You are born, you live, you die. When you're not performing your pre-programmed daily routine on autopilot, you begin to suffer. Just like the caged bird, you hate the thought of being free. Your mind, although a tool for building up, is also prone to beating itself back down. When you are not obsessing over the minor distractions in your life, you fantasize. You fantasize about what you could have been and what you could soon be. As a result, you never truly live in the present moment, the only thing you really have. However, instead of facing this reality, you seek something more. You absolutely crave seeing your friends acknowledge your superiorness. When there's nothing to do, you watch and read stories that you won't remember tomorrow. You will spend hours watching a show you care little about. You will read and complain about politics you have no power over. You will learn things that give you a brief sense of purpose or entertainment. You get a tickling feeling when someone likes one of your posts on social media. But this doesn't satiate your true thirst. Why do you do this? Why consume something that only gave you at most a brief chuckle when it is entirely meaningless? Why debate someone when it's very clear that both of you will not change in the slightest? Why do you read about political or natural events that you have no power over? Simple. You think that what you truly want is validation. You love that little, non-physical tingling feeling you get when you read something mildly amusing. You love when people you will never meet give you validation that you don't need. You feel accomplished for saying something that has no real value outside of your own preconceived vision of the best possible outcome. Why? Because you think you want validation. However, validation isn't enough. It was never enough. You always wanted something, anything to distract you from the brutal reality of the ways of the world. So you have always felt restless and desperate for meaning, for anything other than occasional validation. You feel as though you are trapped within your own mind. You have been looking for this something your entire life. Some people try to find this something within religions, politics, science, or even literary fiction and philosophy. However, I know the truth. I know what you are looking for. I struggled for decades just like you. However, I found it. I found what you want. I found what we want. I found that meaning that you so desperately crave. Power isn't what you think it is. Those who have it want you to believe that it's wrong, that it's evil and should be vilified. This is an inherent falsehood. The powers that be want you to be weak. They want you to feel as though you are satisfied with your simple belongings and ordinary lifestyle. Why? Because there is only so much room at the top, and those ruthless enough to make it don't feel like sharing. If power is so evil and wrong, then why do you feel so good when you have it? and so weak and unfulfilled when you don't. Be honest with yourself for a moment. You love power. You might give it a different name, like authority, tradition, passion, and respect. But really, they're all one and the same. Let's face reality. You want to be the guy on top. You want to be the big man upstairs. The negotiator, the king, the liberator, the popular guy. Why? Because it's simple human nature. 
The one thing that humans do that other creatures don't is that they create order where there is none. And that is what power truly is, giving order to where it previously didn't exist. That's why some figures are vilified in history. Genghis Khan, Joseph Stalin, Adolf Hitler, Osama Bin Laden, and so on. What do these figures have in common? They are considered evil, outcast to society, that should be shunned and vilified to the highest degree. Rightly so, they did some horrible things. The ignorant mutter. No, it's not because of their actions. It's because they knew how to work the system. They knew what buttons to push to gain power. They all started with nothing. All pushed until they could not push anymore. And then they pushed them more. That's why they are really hated. They did where others did not. This is what it means to have power. To change what's around you. To work hard and get what is rightfully yours. And I can give you what you want. For something small, a rather insignificant speck. A speck that causes everything you hate about yourself. I can give you anything you have ever wanted. That is, if you give me your essence. Your soul, so to speak. Tell me what you want and I can give it to you. For no one missed you before you were born. And no one will miss you after you die. Thoroughly intrigued yet still terrified by this, I blurted out. I just want the pain to stop. I want everything I hate about myself to disappear. And with that, Nomad momentarily paused, looking straight through me as a cat looks at a caged bird. And then suddenly, he gave the loudest, most blood curdling scream possible. Nomad began to grow, with his essence very quickly doubling in size. His laugh grew in intensity and volume, as he engulfed quite possibly the entire room. My mouth began to slightly foam at the scene, as I slowly, yet distinctively, drifted into unconsciousness. Before I knew what happened, I immediately opened my eyes, gasping for air as I exited my dreamless sleep. I woke to find myself in my room, completely safe, physiologically unharmed. I began to slightly panic, worrying about where Nomad was and what had happened. However, after a few seconds, I was able to convince myself that it had simply been a nightmare. As I let out a figurative sigh of relief, I willed myself to get up and move. However, to my surprise, I wasn't able to even twitch in response. As I began to breathe heavily and panic to the point of tears, I venomously looked around for something, anything, that could help me in my predicament. Suddenly, through the chaos, I suddenly realized I was up somewhere high. Looking around frantically, I began to eye my surroundings carefully in an effort to find something, anything, to help me free myself from whatever was binding me still. To my surprise, everything was the same. And by everything, I mean everything. Not one thing in the room was misplaced. Even my toothbrush was back to where it should have been in the first place. Over the sound of my boisterous breath, I pondered what was happening. And then I had an epiphany. I was looking at the room at an angle that shouldn't be possible. But that can only mean that somehow, in some way, I was looking at my room through my bathroom cabinet. I tried to reach out, break through my figurative shackles, and burst back into my room. I stretched my arms back and with all my strength in my body, I slammed forward as forcefully as I could muster. To my surprise, I felt nothing but a fine glass barrier. I began hitting the glass like a madman, with every hit being less impactful as the one before. But nothing. My vision began to fade as my hands began to shake in fear. My throat began to greatly tighten as I looked up and I let out a small, pitiful whimper. As I recovered from my display of utmost defeat, I began to compose myself and look back down. However, as my vision cleared to an adequate level, I noticed something in the corner of my eye. In my bed was Nomad, sound asleep with his back turned to me. As I vigilantly stared at Nomad, 
with malice in my heart and fear in my mind, I began to fruitlessly bang against the mirror. As I stared at Nomad, he slightly turned to my bed, now facing me. I noticed he had a huge, sadistic grin splattered across his face. The door to my room swung open and I heard a familiar voice. Good morning to my son Nave. It's time to get ready for school. Your dad is waiting for you outside, said my mother. I began to scream.